Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. My name is Graham Brown. Today I want to welcome to the show somebody very special, not just because his name is Graham, but he's got a background which I think we can all learn a little bit from. Graham Ross, entrepreneur, endurance athlete. We're going to talk about Ironman, the Great Wall Marathon, what else? Black belt, Mai Tai, motorbike racing, being a TV company executive, moving from Australia to Singapore, Singapore to Australia, setting up a company, leaving a company, setting up another company, everything in between, being successful on Kickstarter and designing and producing the greenest tea on the planet. Welcome to the show, Graham. Hi, Graham. Thanks for having me on board. It's fantastic to have you here. Where do we start? Because there's so much to talk about in your background, Graham. I mean, not only have you done, well, four Ironmans, nine half Ironmans, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff to throw in as well. I mean, the motorbike racing as well. Let's start, I mean, the craziest part, the motorbike racing, Phillip Island, Australia. Tell us a little bit about that. Wow, Phillip Island. Phillip Island is one of those really special places. It's off, um, for those who don't know, it's off the bottom of Australia, about an hour or two away from the capital city of Victoria, Melbourne. Um, it's a current uh, round of the motorcycle uh, GP, um, and it and it was, or it is still, the fastest motorcycle track in the world. Um, it's, uh, it's sat right on the coast. And so, um, from most of the parts of the, the course, you can actually see the water. And so, um, there's one part where you, when you come around the last corner before you come onto the main straight, you can, all you can see is, is blue ocean, um, cause you're coming down and there's a, there's a dip. And so that, that in itself is, uh, quite exhilarating at sort of, um, well, I think the MotoGP bikes are at about 350 kilometers an hour. Jesus. I think I, mine topped out at about 270 and that was that was more than fast enough. Um, my, uh, sorry? 270K coming down the hill towards the ocean. I can't imagine it. I mean, yeah. coming down on a bike, yeah. a push bike at 60K, it's pretty scary. 270 <laughs> something else. <laughs> Uh, no, well, I think most of the time is um, going going straight at speed is easy. It's uh, it's the stopping is yeah. often hard, but also um, going around corners. You know, um, if you've got your your knee on the ground at 100 mile an hour, um, with your elbow and your face close to the road, that's that's that really does give you some focus. It's um it's I've been very lucky. I I, my, I grew up in a family of motorcycle riders, and so I could ride at about four years of age, um, and I I, I kind of lost it for a while and. Um, as I got older, I you know, had a motorcycle and I rode backwards and forwards to work. And at that stage, I was living in Sydney. And um, I, I remember coming home to my wife one day and saying, I'm, it's, I have to stop riding to work. It's far too dangerous, um, which is kind of funny, the amount of riding I do on my bicycle now. Right. Um, and I, I said to her, I'd like to, I'd like to continue my passion for motorcycle riding, but I'd like to go back to motorcycle racing. And um, uh <laughs> She said, okay, and um, before she knew it, we had a motorcycle. And I remember um, going out to my first race and talking to somebody, and they said, they said, um, they said, oh, before I went out racing, they sent me this link about this to this website, and it was basically a list of all the things you need to go motorcycle racing, I suppose, like as triathletes, all the things you need to go to do a triathlon race. And I remember looking at these things thinking, I'll never need this amount of stuff. And within six months, I had everything, including <laughs> trailers and spare wheels and tires and it's kind of a bit like, uh, you know, triathlon stuff. You kind of think yeah. you never need all this stuff. And then one day, yeah, you, you buy the lot. So, yeah, I've been incredibly lucky to do that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was that was a great part of my life. Um, I um, we, we won a things. Um, I broke some bones. Um, we, you know, we uh, – and one of the great things for me, I was really lucky to uh, spend time traveling around Australia with my father who's um, – Who's a, who, who gave me the passion for that motorcycling, and I got to share that with him. Um, although <laughs> he's uh, at times we had some fun things like set, setting gloves on fire and all sorts of stuff, but it was it was a great opportunity, and um, mm. uh, I would I would gladly go back to it tomorrow. Do you? Th I mean, you said that you grew up in a family of riders, and at age four yep. you could ride a bike, ride a motorbike, <laughs> not ride a bike. When most kids are riding bikes, you were riding a motorbike, so. Do you, would you think you were wired differently in any way to other kids because you know to enjoy that experience of hurtling down the track at 270 or going around a corner with your knee on the ground at 100k and then you know when you stop riding then to be doing Ironmans later which we're talking about as well as karate and Mai Tai and all that do you feel that you're wired differently in any way? 
I think I'm I'm just naturally curious um, and interested. I don't think I'm a I don't think I'm a daredevil by any sense. I've, mm. I've got some friends who I would consider to be quite um, sort of daredevilish. Um, I just think I have a, have a have a real interest, and I think uh, there's a methodology. I'm not I'm not definitely not the first person to jump off the bridge, but I'll have thought about you know, what it would be like to jump off the bridge. And there might be a calculated, I think I'm quite calculated about the things I do. Um, there's a, there's a, there's an approach, but then also I think like a lot of, a lot of the people I spend time with, it's about trying to find that how much more there is, there is inside you. Like what, where's, where's that edge? Like where, where's that bit where, uh, you know, you're either afraid to, to go past and what does it take to get past that? Um, I also think there's a, it's, there's an interest in, in gathering a whole bunch of skills that, that make you a better person or challenge you to be a better person. And I find that's the sort of stuff. And not from a, you know, a great, I don't wake up every morning thinking I need to be a better person, but I've just got an interest in things. And, and the more I spend time with other people, you get an interest in what they're doing. And it doesn't have to be physical. It can be mental, but it can also be anything that takes you out of that comfort zone. I think that's where I, I like to be. I like mm-hmm. to be feeling a little bit vulnerable, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, uh, yeah, and, and not for anything else, but just as a sort of a personal satisfaction. Yeah, no, those are great words. So we talk about the people you hang around with and how that's important in influencing your expectations and belief as well later on. Coming back to the, what you're talking about, stepping outside your comfort zone and how important that is, not just in the, the physical side of things, but also the business side of things, because you ran an independent production company in Australia, which was pretty successful. So you were an entrepreneur from, I guess, an early age. So what was the story there? Was that your first business? How did you get into that? And where did that go? Uh, I think um, it's pretty easy to sum up. Um, I don't work well with others. Right. So I, I'm better <laughs> off being, being, being the boss. Um, I am, um, I've had, I've had, I had a, a career in television up through the ranks um, and I've been incredibly lucky to work in different regions and different areas and have great experiences um, and I had I've had the opportunity when I was in Sydney um, to move into a new a new sphere I saw the industry changing and I think this is probably now looking back I can see there's a there's a, there's a trait in me to to look at the opportunity for industries to change and to, to take advantage of that mm-hmm. and so um, before my last production company, there's an opportunity where the television industry here in Australia was transitioning from using um, tape-based um, machines to uh, computer-based, a non-linear-based machine. Um, and I saw that opportunity, and I um, had to. I approached the company that was importing the machines and and got hold of a, a basically a manual. Um, of which is about four or five hundred pages, and right. taught myself how to use this machine. Um, and then I went and found somebody who was looking for somebody to use that machine. But realistically, I hadn't actually sat down and used the machine. I just learned it from a book. So um, I, I went in for a job interview. They said, "Great, um, can you start in two weeks? Do you know how you use this machine?" I said, "Yes." Can you start in two weeks? I said, yes. And so I turned up on the first day, you know, with plenty of knowledge in my head, but not really any idea right. how to use this machine. Um, but, you know, I spent time afterwards and I made that work. And so from there, I was able to build a, I, I was able to build a career and a business. And I, I, me- I remember buying the first machine in Australasia. And I owed more on that than I did on my home loan. My, my home loan. My wife had just had our second child, mm-hmm. um, and so she wasn't working. Um, and um, I didn't have any business in that 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 for a month. And so I sat there sharpening my pencils, going, "Okay, <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do here?" Um, but eventually, um, we got our first job, and from there we grew to um, many more machines and more people, and becoming one of the, you know we were the go-to company for new programming here in Australia. And then from there, I formed another company with my two of my clients um, because I wanted to get back and making our own programming. And then so we made a bunch of programming for the Australian networks, but also for overseas networks. Um, had some opportunity to travel overseas and sell programming and, and develop some stuff and work with some really clever people around the world. So that it's kind of like that, that one small step of making decision mm. set me on the path to where I ended up. Yeah. It's a great story as well. I mean, you built a super successful company and that was really a building block for Kusaga Athletic, the performance sportswear 
brand that you're working with now, which we'll come to in a minute. I'm just curious with the the life cycle, the journey that you went through with your production company, whether or not that sort of reflects as well what you said about riding a motorbike as well, is that you know you, you get it to a stage and maybe you've mastered it and you need to then go and reinvent yourself or step outside your comfort zone, or, or maybe you become comfortable within that discipline itself, whether it's running a business or you know that business or being a bike rider, then you need to step outside and throw yourself out there and be a bit vulnerable and start something new. So with that production company, what was the end game there? What happened? I mean, how long did you run that company and then what happened? At what point did you decide to get out? Um, I think we had the company for about four years, um, four or five years. The company went from nothing to a significant business in a very short period of time. And that put a lot of pressure on um, the foundations as it, it scaled. Um, I think at once you know, we had 50 staff at one stage um, and programming all over the world, um, crews all over the world. Just the logistics of getting through each week was astounding. Um, it was incredibly rewarding. I think as it went on, the, the, the nature of the business in Australia certainly changed. Um, the business became a little bit harder to be profitable. Um, or it took many more resources for it to be profitable. It took much more time, um, which became a challenge. Um, at that stage, my business partners and I were a little different uh, life cycles. They had younger children, and my children were getting a little older. Um, I was finding that I was spending, you know, if I wasn't away racing motorcycles, I was at work, and so that that put a lot of strain on my family. And um, my wife had an opportunity. She was working for a corporate uh, company an opportunity to move to Asia um, and we sat down as a family um, and discussed the opportunity to taking our kids to give them opportunity to live overseas um, for her to further a career overseas and then uh, and probably you know it's a tough thing to admit um, to uh, wake my wake myself up at, at that stage I was well overweight I had high blood pressure um, and I was probably you know, I don't like to admit this, but maybe quite a miserable person to be, right. to be around. And um, and so we saw that as a, a basically a fresh start. And also maybe the writing was on the wall that um, looking back that, that my time in television had come to an end. I'd kind of achieved what I needed out of that career. And maybe I was looking for something else. And I think I hadn't quite maybe not admitted that to myself. Mm. Um, and and thankfully, I mean, if any, any, any of the listeners have, you know, good partners in their lives um your partners your wife or your girlfriend or your, your husband uh, they do give you pretty honest feedback and i think there's some times in your life that you really do need that kind of real honest feedback to make a change well let's be honest here we were talking off air how, how did your <laughs> wife put it to you what was, what was the deal that she put on the table when she asked you if i can put that in air quotes uh, to move to singapore um yeah, she she basically I think she said that um, that I was you know paraphrasing that I was a miserable bastard and if I didn't come off to Asia with us then I'd be kind of living by myself. So <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. Well, can, you can't refuse that um, offer, can you? Well, look, and as usual, she was right. Um, and you know, I, I hope she doesn't mind me sort of airing our conversation to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but that's made you. I think that's so important, though. I mean, you do say how important that moment was in sort of your journey as well because you've moved from sydney now to singapore to give you you know all of you a better life mm -hmm. and you were in your own words a miserable bastard or in your wife's words a miserable bastard and overweight mm -hmm. but you moved to singapore and then this, you you work you're still working in tv at this point but you there's also another transition going on as well there's a physical transition that's happening now you're starting to get into races and stuff like that what was the story there yeah so so when you move to another country that, that's that's great um and it's 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 really forming for your family you become this real tight nucleus because you don't have you don't have family. You haven't established long-term friendships, and you, and every day is an adventure. So the great thing about living in another country is that every day you walk down a street that you've never been down, and so you're just discovering things constantly. But it does make you feel a little uncomfortable, um, whether it's language or culture or or just familiarity. Um, so one of the things that I try to do is I try to say yes to any invitation because you just don't know what that invitation is going to deliver. 
Um, and so what I found myself uh, met, going out and meeting people and finding myself at run tracks and then being sort of introduced into triathlon. Um, I'd always played, I'd previously played football um, and, you know, and done a bit of running, but nothing nothing along the lines of um, marathons or, or triathlons. And so just by the association, I think when you're an expat, there's a couple of opportunities for you. One is um, you spend most of your life traveling around, having a great old time, um, drinking and living it up. And then the others find an opportunity to kind of reimagine their life and you know get healthy and discover a whole bunch of things. So I, I chose the the latter. So I was I think I was at about 95 kilograms at that stage. I'm six foot one, so I was it was, wow. it was I was a solid boy. Um, um, and so yes, my first uh, triathlon suit was a real good look. Um, <laughs> so I had to <laughs> imagine. Um, I've saved that photo. That's something you're to yeah, pull I'm out imagining it now because you're at the same height as me. So I'm imagining you you were at that time or 15 kilos more than me now. Yeah, so. I lost 20 kilos. I lost wow. 20 kilos. I think I, I raced Ironman Switzerland at about 67 kilos, which was a bit oh light. My. But um, I think around low 70s is a is a good weight for me. Um, and you can keep your body fat down at a reasonable at reasonable weight. But um, so I, uh, my first triathlon was a sprint triathlon. Um, and um, I don't know if anybody else has, has, has seen this, but I was the guy on the bike leg with a mountain bike, <laughs> an aluminum frame mountain bike with knobby tires. Yeah. And and I, I was astounded by these people going past in on aero bikes and these wheels that made noise in the road and these funny helmets. And I, I was, I, I'd never seen anything like it before. And I'm going, what, what, God. And so, like, thankfully, it was only 20 Ks, but 20 Ks on a mountain bike on knobby, right, right, knobby right. tires. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember finishing it and I was like, I, I was, I was exhausted. Like, I, I hurt in every place. And I was, I was, I was really interesting. It was a combination of being completely exhausted, but completely like, can we do that again? <laughs> How good was that? Right. Because um, you were like a beginner now. I mean, that's the fascinating thing, isn't it? You've got this amazing ability to, go into something new to learn the the system if you like and master it and now you're coming to this new sport where you're a complete beginner and a lot of people in that situation graham would go screw this i look like an idiot people are laughing at me <laughs> they're shouting at me those aero boys were shouting at me to get out the hang left get out the way so when you were saying yeah let's do this again what, what's the, what drives you what's the motivator for the, the the man that thinks like that Oh, you know, I think it's it's the challenge. It's the like, I think as we all know, that you in any distance, whether it's sprint, half Ironman, Ironman, there's so many times during that event, you there's a voice in your head questioning why you're doing it, right. um, and there's points where you have to keep asking yourself, or or just almost doing checks in with the body, how do the legs feel, am I breathing okay, whatever. So I think what it is, it's that it's that 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 getting to know yourself better, the the ability to start to kind of put all those parts together and push, but also then, then also a strategy of um, you can't just go hard all the time. There's got to be some sort of give and take, but also then managing, you know, if you're a better swimmer, then swim well, um, swim hard, and then taper off through the bike and the run. But if you're a better runner, save yourself until you get to that run and then let it all go. So I think I really like the strategy. Mm. Uh, what I also liked is the the community, um, the community of people, um, not only the spectators, but also the athletes, the support pre-race and during the race. I think there's a real, and I've, 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 I've found this now, I've got friends all over the world through triathlon and they're some of the best friends. Um, I love triath I love endurance people because even if, you know, they've got a severed artery or, you know, they've broken a bone and you say, how are you going? They always say, yeah, good, how are you? Like there's always a positivity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think being surrounded those kind of people is, is wonderful. That's what you need to have in your life. And I think um, – I, I discovered a, a good bunch of friends who I saw, I saw them achieving on the day, but then also I saw the guys who were leading the race, mm. and I saw um, the efforts that they put in to do it, and they were they were puffing as much as I was, but they they'd obviously put in more time or more effort or more focused effort to be something, and and so I suppose I aspired to be that guy coming out of the water mm. first. Um, I aspired to be the guy who got on the bike. Um, you know, I think I, I obviously like. <laughs> Probably coming back to my motorbike days, I aspired to owning more kit. <laughs> right. And triathlon, you're in a perfect place to spend as much money as you like on kit, right? Absolutely. Give me one of those bikes and one of those funny helmets. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm there. Exactly. So there you are. You've done your first sprint triathlon and you go on to do 
four Ironmans and nine half Ironmans. And I want to talk about the Great Wall Marathon as well coming up because that that alone is you know fascinating to me. Staying with the Ironman circuit for a little bit, what of all those races, if you could pick one which was like your perfect race, or if you had a perfect race, your best race, which one would it have been? Um, okay, um, before we get to that, let me let me uh, introduce. So I I signed on to do an Ironman event. I was in Singapore and I signed on to do Ironman New Zealand. And uh, one of my great friends now, who I who I um, see regularly, and we we cycle once a year in the Alps. Um, uh, Steve, he is a Kiwi, and um, so we signed up together to go back and do Ironman New Zealand. Mm. And I was currently living in Singapore. In between the time between signing up and the actual race, we relocated to London. Right. Um, so I couldn't have got any further away from <laughs> my first Ironman race. Um, and then through a, a bunch of circumstances, unfortunately, Stephen couldn't make the event. And so um, I remember sitting in um, Heathrow Terminal about to board the plane and going through all those kind of – I was actually writing a bit of a, a thought of, of how I felt about the whole thing. And, and I think there was the exhilaration of – of um, actually making the, the point to be able to go to the Ironman, mm. um, the the, rec- re- the reflection of um, training in the heat of Asia and then relocating to training in the, the cold of England yeah, yeah. and that sort of transition um, and then and how I got there and then also the fact that I was, I was alone. Like I travelled to New Zealand by myself and so I was getting on a plane to go down to do an Ironman that I didn't – that, you know, you have all these expectations – and I think sometimes we also have these 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 thoughts that we're going to become this massively different people or whatever, and um, and sometimes that's not always the reality. Exactly. And um, oh, so we went down to New Zealand, and there was this massive storm in Australia that blew across to New Zealand and wiped out the race. Wow! So the race there was blowing uh, gale force winds on the Saturday. The race got cancelled. Um, hats off to the the organisers of New Zealand um, Ironman. They scrambled around and put on a seventy point three on the Sunday. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So at least we got to do something. But like I was one of um, a whole bunch of like at that year there was a, there was a lot of newbies. Um, there's a, like forty percent of the field with newbies, and we'd all come down to do our first Ironman race, and mm. uh, it didn't happen. So then I, I moved back to uh, back to London, and Ironman offered offered us a you know access to another race somewhere, and so I signed up for Ironman Regensburg in Germany. Mm. The great thing about this, I had got the opportunity to take my family there, and that was my first Ironman. And I probably, looking back to it, it was my favourite. It was uh, the venue we, running in and out around the the town with cobbled streets. The fact that my family got to come there and sort of experience Ironman for that that. For the first time, that real, that made it really special. Um, it uh, the running up the shoot for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it just just the whole week away. I think when anybody who's had the opportunity to, to be in that circus, that week of Iron Man circus, is just it's indescribable. And there's a huge opportunity to to really soak up a whole bunch of um, opportunities. Um, I think sometimes. We all get caught up as athletes going, oh, I need to rest, I need to put my feet up, I can't do this, I can't do that. But realistically, that week is there's so many things to see and do, especially if you're racing outside of your own country. Mm-hmm. Um, it delivers on so much more. And I think that was what was really important. And all my events have been outside of Australia, and I've loved I loved racing in you know uh, countries that I don't understand half of what, what's going on. <laughs> you love the challenge, um, to add extra challenge to the existing challenge, you go and race in a different country. I'm fascinated about that New Zealand story as well, because you had effectively plenty of opportunities to get out and not do it. Because, you know, if, if you said to everybody for the months running up to Ironman New Zealand that you're doing Ironman New Zealand and I'm going to do this, and everybody was on board and then it didn't happen. If you were to say, yeah, well, there was a storm or the thing got cancelled, you could have easily backed out of it and got away with it, right? It saved your face, but you still went ahead and got down there. Not just got down there from, you know, going to New Zealand. You're going from the UK, which is a 27-hour flight or something like that with all the stoppages. So, yeah. I mean, you yeah. had plenty of opportunities to get out of jail free but you made it down there so hats off to you for that you know that took something to get down there and you must have been shattered by the time you even got to the start line 
It was, um, I think looking back, uh, I, I went with part of a group. So I traveled by myself, but there was a group. It was run by a guy called Ken Glar, and he's a former uh, Ironman pro. So he raced, he raced back when. Um, and I think he's just currently, he just qualified again for his 32nd or 33rd time at Kona. Um, remarkable man. So I had the opportunity to spend some time with, with, with people like himself and a whole bunch of other people I met going down to race for the first time from all over the world. And all, all those people are part of my, you know, my circle now. Um, uh, look, you know, I, I kind of, I'm one of these guys who I finish things. You know what I mean? I, I, mm. My wife, my wife will start fourteen different books and finish half of them. Whereas I'll, like, even if I don't like a book, I like I'll just chug through the. Like I don't know. I just seem if I start something, I like to finish it. I don't know why. Um, and so it was never a question of not going, um, because you put in all that training, and so you need to get some sort of finish to that 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 sort of thing. And it's also what an adventure, what an opportunity to go to New Zealand. Like New Zealand's such a remarkable place. Yeah, yeah. No um, so it was, never, it was never in my thoughts not to go. Fantastic. Let's talk about other adventures as well. Great Wall Marathon. It's not just a marathon, it's a marathon on the Great Wall. So it has how many steps? I don't know. Is, have they been counted? 5,200. <laughs> 5,200. Were you on the Stairmaster before you went to that marathon? How did you work <laughs> out for that? How does, tell us a bit about the Great Wall Marathon. For those that don't know, what's it about? Uh, Okay, absolutely. So, so my entry to the Great War Marathon was um, I went out to dinner with um, my wife's colleague and her husband, and um, he's, he mentioned that he was going to sign up for this thing called the Great War Marathon, and I said, good on you. <laughs> right. um, this is all pre-Iron Man, pre-anything. Um, and he called me up on the Monday. He's an Australian, and he became my business partner, but he said to me, um, I'm signing up to do the great one. You know, I'm filling in the form. Are you on? And I said, oh, no. He said, oh, come on. I said, okay, look, I'll do the half. And I won't, I won't, I won't repeat what he said to me, but it was, it was, it was basically a challenge to, you know, for want of a better word, my manliness. <laughs> and I said, right, okay, you're on. Let's do that. And then I kind of got off the call and went, I've just signed off for a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so off we went to, um, went to Beijing um, and we both flew in sort of only a day or two before and um, to get to the Great Wall where they where they hosted, it's about a three-hour bus ride. And so you're leaving at 3.30 or 4 a.m. in the morning. So um, you get out to the wall. Um, we did this back in 2010. Um, so it was, it was still emerging. Um, there's, like we said, there's 5,200 steps. You spend about somewhere between 15, I think it's about 17 or 20 Ks on the wall itself, mm. and the rest of the time you're out through the villages. And so you're, you're running along and running through these villages, and it's lined with um, kids and elderly people all cheering and clapping and, um, and encouraging runners. And, yeah, and so you get a real connection of uh, being part of such an incredible structure, something that's been man-made on, and on a scale that's almost unbelievable. Um, but then also you're interacting with descendants of the people who built the wall. Um, and I, and it's one of those places where, um, you, you kind of have to stop and stop. Like you're running along kind of in marathon mode, trying to keep going. And then you kind of look over and you'll just, uh, you'll be, you'll see something that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Um, the, 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 the wall snaking up over these mountains that seem, you can't even fathom how they've managed to build it. Right. Um, up there um, and then also the, the, the steps are at different heights so it's not like they're all at even heights like you would have at normal steps they're at they're different heights um, some you have to crawl up because right. they're so high difference yeah um, so they can go from you know 30 well we took in uh, centimeters 30 centimeters to maybe um, almost a meter oh. um, in difference and um, and then also you think they've been walked on for centuries so they're all worn in different places and so <laughs> There's no um, rhythm. And then, there's no rhythm at all. And, and then also you're watching all the experiences. So you've got people yeah, yeah. just experiencing being, running a marathon. Um, so basically you, you leave a battlement, you run out, you go um, up the wall, then you go out through the villages and out through the sort of uh, um, farm areas and stuff, then you, and up and down. There's quite some quite hilly in places, and then you come back onto the wall. So – Going up and coming down the wall is hard, and then you run out, but then coming back to the wall at about 30-odd Ks, 32 or 33 Ks. 
And then you basically, you, you have to crane your neck up to see the top of where you've got to get to. Mm. And then you start. And it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's brutal. Um, that and that's brutal. when, that's, yeah. But then you, you run down and you run back through the village and you come into the back in the battlement and the, the feeling of elation, like I'm happy to admit, I cried. And my, my, my mate who finished, he cried. I cried afterwards. Like I just, it was such a, it was such an incredibly emotional appearance. And, and I think probably I've never been that physically stretched in my life. And mm. so um, I think that was probably in looking back, that was a real pointer in, in, a, in a life achievement that set me forward. And I can kind of look back to that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I bet. yeah. And also you did that twice and your business partner <laughs> did it after, am I right here? Did it after coming out of the hospital? What was the story there? Uh, yeah, so I've got a really close friend of ours who um, had um, brain surgery um, a few years ago, um, two years ago, and she uh, she had, she had a, quite a few complications and um, that were really quite life threatening. And I remember she said to me as she's recuperating, she said, "I found you doing that Great Wall Marathon really inspiring." And I've gone, "Really?" <laughs> and she said, "Yeah, really inspiring." She said, "Look, if if I ever get fit enough, would you do it with me?" Wow. And like at that stage. I would have said anything. Yeah, absolutely. You want me to fly the moon? Absolutely. Thinking that she would, would never have to do it because she wasn't a runner. There, that, that wasn't part of what she did. She, she was a mum of four kids. She was working. Right, right. She had a husband and had a business. So she, her life was pretty full. So she gets fit and she discovers trail running. Not, this, and not only does she discover trail running, it becomes like borders on an obsession. And so um, so she said, I'm ready to do the Great Wall. So we sign up for the 2016 Great Wall Marathon. By this stage, I'm mid-business, so I'm working my butt off and yeah. not really training nearly at the right level. She's running 50 plus, uh, uh, 50K plus trail runs and getting as fit as. And, um, and so I think I, the longest run I had before the last race was 18Ks, oh. and she was, yeah, she was clocking up weekly you know, 100K plus runs, and it's like, okay. But it was like – and then so it was tremendous to go over there with her um, – Especially, I'd been to China a few times, and um, it can be confronting for people who, uh, you know, not expecting it. And and so there's a whole bunch of stuff um, that was really kind of off-putting for her. not off-putting, but just um, mm. making you kind of think about things. Um, and but being on that wall with her and watching her um, understand what she's achieving. So. Um, one of the challenges I had was um, it wasn't a challenge, but one of the things I had to reference it. Which she had to wear a heart rate monitor, and we couldn't let her go over 170 beats per minute because there was a, there was a chance that she might have a seizure. No. Um, and so I'm kind of going, I don't want to be 20 k's under the Great Wall no, no. Marathon in the middle of China. Um, yeah. So, um, but so every time her watch went, it went beep. We would we would walk, and so that would, that's the great run walk method, and we were there just to enjoy it. But I've got to say. As we got to the back end of the um, the race, um, she, I th she said to me, "You seem to be anticipating this. Uh, me, my heart rate getting up, but it was really I was bugged." <laughs> so please be, I need a walk. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think one of the most emotional times I've had um, it was the back end. She was she was running really strongly right at the end, up and down the walls, um, and then we we ran down into the village and we stopped about a k and a half from the finish line. It's actually a bit emotional for me now. Um, and and she broke down. It was it was this real outpouring of emotion for from what she's been able to to come from yeah, yeah. basically ICU to finishing a lifelong dream. And um, I was so wonderful to be part of that. And uh, you know, and so one of the funny stories she she she's not allowed to drink, but she always has a Guinness beer after every event. Mm. And so I had to find a Guinness. I had to find an Irish pub in the middle of Beijing, <laughs> which you know. <laughs> so we found an Irish pub in the middle of Beijing. We we get there and we um, we order a Guinness and I and the, the the waitress says to us, "Do you want do you want the small one or the large one?" And um, we said to she said, oh, "Well, what's different?" She said, "Oh, the guy over there he's drinking the small one." And so we went. It wasn't that big, so we went. Oh, we'll have the large one. It, it it turned out it wasn't a pint. It was like uh, two pints of wow. beer. And so uh, <laughs> she's earned it. Yeah, she certainly had it. Um, yeah, so there's wobbly story. legs on the way out. Yeah, no, so I, I was very lucky. Yeah, it was a real, real highlight to life. But I think if anybody has an opportunity to run any event overseas, but in particular the Great Wall Marathon, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a highlight. 
it's such a highlight amazing an amazing story an amazing adventure as well and your life is full of adventures and we this sort of brings us to the the current adventure which you're on which is Kasaga Athletic which is well effectively building making producing the greenest tea on the planet what's the story there you, you've you know you've come into a an industry which with all due respect you don't know much about really you know you're not you know you didn't come from a fabric or a textile background and now you're mm -hmm. producing t-shirts what's what why is my question why did you do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i'm asking myself that a few times i think um so to encapsulate so kasaga athletic makes future fabrics and uh, sustainable lifestyle apparel for run, for yoga, for gym, or just for outdoors, for every day. My access point to that, I think like most athletes, um, it's great to get a free t-shirt when you finish your race. And um, I was lucky enough to, to, to get quite a few. And I did, and I, and you know, I kind of like everybody, you like to wear the shirt that says you've finished this Ironman or did whatever. Um, my frustration, and I think the frustration with a lot of the people I've spoken to is that the, often those, those garments, um, don't quite fit and the quality of the fabric isn't kind of up to the, what you would expect. And so one day I was in London um, and I happened to look in my wardrobe and I think I said this before, um, I've been married for a while. So my wife buys, has been buying my clothes for a while. So I had no idea what my clothes were made out of. Um, and I looked in my wardrobe and it was piled up full of these finishes shirts. And so I, I, I took some time to have a look at them and I, see what they're made of. So I looked at care labels, said polyester or spandex or nylon. And like most athletes, you know, we've got a wardrobe full of that stuff. And mostly that's kind of what we spend our life in. Um, and so then I went, okay, that's cool. But what does all that mean? So I, I you know, I went to the world's great resource, Google, and uh, Googled polyester and spandex and nylon and, um, the more I started to read, the more I understood the impact that the textile industry has on our everyday lives, but also, importantly, how much it has on the planet. And part of the journey that coming back to the Great War Marathon with myself and Matt was we did we were talking about forming a business that that did more than make television programs, something that had a had an environmental or social benefit for our children as the world is growing up. And I think most people know about climate change and we all kind of have concern about you know recycling and doing the right thing by each other and, and also our planet but we kind of wanted to be a bit more active mm. and so once once kind of spent time looking at these these fabrics and understanding the impact so um just to give everybody an idea the textile industry is the second largest polluter on the planet wow. behind the coal industry so that's the kind of scope i mean um you know five times more than the airline industry so um it does have an impact. And one of the other things I like to say is like every person on the planet will touch a textile today, even if you walk around naked, you know, what we sit on, what we sleep on, right. um, the, you know, the curtains. So textiles and fabrics have a, an amazing impact on our lives. And so once I looked at this, I thought, okay, well, there must be somebody, here's a business opportunity. What if we could make um, a shirt that felt great? but was better for the planet. Surely somebody's doing that. So we just need to find who's doing that. And we can, we can do ourselves a range of really cool sportswear um, in a complete naive point of view. Um, you know, we thought we could just make it happen. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so just quickly turning, it turned out that there wasn't, um, you know, we could find some hemp and we could find some bamboo, but for what we wanted for high performance clothing, it just wasn't there. And so um, I did a lot more research and I found um, fibers in, laboratories and hidden away in the back of um, factories. And um, I did what every normal person who's got no idea what they're doing does. I picked up the phone and I called these places and said, hi, I'm Graham. Um, you don't know who I am, but um, I'd like to get hold of your fibers. And so over a period of, period of time, I established a relationship with these, these uh, companies. Um, we managed to get a bunch of fibers, and then, um, which was great. And, they were, and they're exactly what we're looking for. Um, and so then the next challenge we had was we needed to find a factory to make some fabrics. And um, so I went back to Google and went sort of, how do you make fabrics? So I got an understanding of what we needed to do. And I, I, found, I found a factory and um, we managed to take these fibers. I, I did the same thing, called up the, fa the factory and said, hi, I'm Graham. You don't know who I am, but I've got all these fibers you don't know about either, but we're going to make some fabrics. And... Um, over a period of a couple of years with um, you know, lots of failures, lots of you know, red stamps and um, challenges and 
lots of conversations about direction and that sort of stuff. And, um, and, and the amazing support by family and friends because um, this was you know, self-funded. Um, we managed to create uh, a couple of fabrics um, and um, then we started to make some shirts. And so um, Matt and I would, would uh, test. He was in Singapore and I was in London, so he'd be testing in the heat, I'd be test testing in the cold. So we had cycle jerseys and run shirts and that sort of stuff. And then we got to the point where we need to make a decision. At the end of the day, everything was kind of a hypothesis. So you know, we need to kind of prove that to find out if did anybody else care like we did. So mm. we launched. Um, we figured what we need to do is find a product that everybody owned, and so we kind of figured everyone owns a t-shirt. And then we went, okay, let's let's make the greenest t-shirt on the planet. And so uh, we did that, and um, we launched on Kickstarter uh, late 2015. Um, and uh, we found a whole bunch of people who did care care like us, and so we successfully funded that. Um, the reason that why we call it a greenest T-shirt on the planet, an average. This is a, a startling fact that still blows me away today. The average cotton T-shirt uses three thousand liters of water. Wow. By the time you water the crop and manufacture the garment, it's three thousand liters. And so when you think about, you've got ten T-shirts in your wardrobe. That's a small swimming pool worth of water. Wow. It's an amazing um, waste, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And so our Greens T-shirt uses less than 1% wow. of that water. I want to find out a bit more so, about what you can share with us about the fabric side as well. But I'm curious, when you decided to start that business, Graham, and I don't want to doubt your entrepreneurial ability <laughs> because you, you're proven as far as I'm concerned. You are an entrepreneur and you've got a track record. But you... You know, I sometimes hear these conversations of people who, you know, they say, you know, I want to start a restaurant. Uh, what kind mm -hmm. of experience have you had in a restaurant? Oh, well, I enjoy eating food, right? And you get that kind of entrepreneur who goes into something new, thinks they can do it, but completely underestimates the, you know, what's involved. It's not what they think it is. Now, I'm only sort of playing devil's advocate here because I know that you can hustle. So when it came to starting that business and actually growing that business, how did it sort of turn out compared to your own expectations? You know, were you doing the kind of things you thought you'd be doing or did you not really have any expectations? You just thought, went into it thinking, well, I'm just going to make some change here. What was the story there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think what, what, what's ha what has it actually evolved is there's been a passion. So what started with um, an idea to maybe do something for the planet and for, for for the people and for my children has become without a doubt the the why the the complete passion as why i'm doing this mm. um the uh, the the fabrics and and the, the shirts um they're, they're part of they're the products but the, the real why that gets me out of bed every day is that i've i've been gifted an opportunity to actually help myself and other people mitigate the effects of climate change i've got an opportunity to help businesses and companies to think differently and to identify how they can make better products that that either don't that have a less impact on the planet in their manufacture but then also the end of life um, I've had an opportunity to spend time with people that just think a very very forward thinking about our opportunities as as a company as companies and as as businesses and as people who inhabit this I think coming back to Casagra athletic the we were we were a couple of guys who had some time and uh, and an interest and from and then had a had possible it's probably a, we had a dream um, like a lot of people what we then had was um, blind luck um, faith um, determination and bloody mindedness to make things happen um, we also didn't take no for an answer um, and we also went into an industry that that we didn't know the problems that we might we might face, and so part of part of the thing, part of the way to un undiscover you know the new opportunities is by not being um, encumbered by the old way of thinking or the way, old way of doing things. And so by coming to things from a different point of view has allowed us to, to do a lot of things. I won't say that you know there was plenty of times we got smacked, <laughs> mm. um, and I think we're still very early in the journey. But um, what would be an example of that where you from? dealing with somebody and you had a different way of thinking which you know created a result which was unexpected or would have been different to what normally would happen 
was that like dealing with suppliers and stuff like that that you have a different mm. way of dealing things yeah with? give us an example oh okay um so just by the very fact of taking a couple of fibers and then trying to make a fabric and so there's a process there's generally there's a process that you would you, there's a known amount of knowledge as to how things would work mm. and how you would do it and i think we we kind of ignored all that and said this is the end goal of what we wanted we wanted a garment that um breathed well had good stretch good moisture wicking um didn't retain any odor and was 100 percent plant based and so any one of those is a problem anyway um and i think communication with our suppliers and um, being a little bit of an evangelist about getting things. So there's a couple of times when um, like 20 kilos of fiber would go into the factory and three meters of fabric would come out um, and and that would be useless. Um, and then you'd have to go back and find some more fiber to, to bring back in to, to, to start that process again. Um, there were some times when we're just even the fact of dyeing different colors um, that you might want to make um, a particular color and it comes out completely wrong um, and when you when you when you minimum dyeing uh, amounts of 500 meters that can be quite costly yeah. I think one of the one of the one of the real challenges happened during our Kickstarter campaign we um, we were working with a, a manufacturing partner in Malaysia and they'd been part of our helping us for a long time they're very close close partners um, they decided to close down their business um, for, a bun of, for a bunch of reasons, but they're very supportive of us. But, but unfortunately, we hadn't fulfilled our five years to our, <laughs> our Kickstarter pledges. Mm. And so we were faced of having all these Kickstarter pledges expecting shirts and um, fabric sitting in the factory wasn't open anymore. Wow. And I was in Sydney and my business partner had moved to London. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> And so, um, so a couple of things happened. One was um, we got contacted by a few of our pledges saying, "What's happening with our t-shirts?" You know, and uh, I remember sitting there going, "I okay, I kind of, what do I do here? How do right. I answer this? Do do I tell them the truth? Do I not tell them the truth? What do I do?" And these so are your fans, wrote, right? These these are the people who are, are most likely to support you. So you can't let these people Absolutely. down. Absolutely, no, you can't let them down. And so we're caught between the whole of stuff. We're also we, we've spent we've pretty much spent our money. Like there was an allocated amount of money that we were prepared to mm. to risk, and um, it, that was getting very very tight. So I couldn't exactly get on a plane and go and spend time anywhere. So um, I sat down and I, I wrote a wrote a, a reply. I opened up and I was really honest and I said, okay, this is kind of what's happened. And I outlined a few other things over and above the the fabric factory shutting down and a few other things and the, the response I got back from people was incredible um, people called back going wrote back to me saying well, we're so glad you shared that we actually wow. don't really care whether we get t-shirts we just want to be part of your journey we think Amazing. what you're doing is incredible and we think that we just want to support you um, but we want to know we, we don't want to hear all the, the wins and stuff we want to we actually want to hear all the, the stuff that goes wrong or the challenges you have because we really want to be part of buying into what you're doing isn't that an insightful lesson? Because you could have easily bullshitted your way through that and said, yeah, no, the fabric's on its way. You know, we're just experiencing a little bit of delay in the factory, but we'll be with you shortly. But you were honest and vulnerable. And yes. You put yourself out there and you got rewarded for that. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that that was one of the, the foundations that Matt and I discussed when we built this building was business was about being off about, you know, we don't, it's not about trying to lie about having you know, textile backgrounds or whatever, or um, mm -hmm. the stuff. We're just a couple of people with with a vision, and but an ability to to turn that into a reality. And so we're now ready to move in that next stage. But I think it's really important with our customers and those people who have supported us from day one, is that we do let we let them know what the journey is is going on, and we let them in. And but also we take a lot of advice from them. We take. Uh, I love the fact that I have people constantly giving me feedback or input into the business mm. um, because that we built the business for them you know mm. and so and and as as the business goes on the more and more people we get the more and more support and impact and the more the larger the community we can build then each day we're actually making a difference and and when you sit here at the moment i'm in sydney but uh, my day, I can have conversations with anywhere in the world. And you think from a small company with an idea only a few years ago, the reach that we're starting to get and 
the opportunities we have to really do um, not only provide people with uh, great products that do what they do, but that are better for the planet. It's um, it's incredibly humbling, I've got to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. And I think it's, it's a great mission that you're on as well. And, you know, sort of thinking about all those race directors out there who, you know, you've got race director friends as well. I mean, they, they spend money on these, these T-shirts, which we've talked about, which are pretty low quality. And, you know, the designs aren't great. You spend a lot of money on the race and you often get, you know, the only physical memory that you take away is that T-shirt, right? And how much better it would be to spend a little bit more and get a better quality T-shirt and have a story to go with it as well. You know, that you're doing something good rather than just, you know, creating this, well, this waste, as you say, 3,000 litres per shirt. Yeah, I think I think there's a tremendous opportunity for any organisation, whether it's a race organisation or a corporatization to corporate corporate organization to look at their impact um, and look at the, their opportunities to be more sustainable, but also to provide a, a good product to your customers and also a product to your supplier. So um, uh, this is, I'm not here to, and I, and I don't, you know, whack event companies because I, I appreciate without them, we wouldn't have a place to race. Um, and I appreciate how difficult it is to coordinate and put some on. But I also think there's an opportunity as a as an athlete for getting taking off my Casagra athletic hat on. If I had a shirt that said, you know, Iron Man, whatever. Um, no, let's let's take a brand. If I had a shirt that said Event, whatever, mm-hmm. that felt great, I would be out running in it every day. And sponsors of that event would would be seen. Um, all the time as opposed to being stuck in my wardrobe. So I think event companies have got an opportunity or an obligation to to showcase the sponsors as much as possible. So uh, um, whether it's our product or my product, but any any event company that there's an opportunity this day and age to start looking at their, you know how they operate in their waste, yeah, yeah. in their water usage, in their just you know how how sustainable that are they. I would call out, I, we work very closely with a company called Evergreen Endurance, and they run an, uh, a long-distance triathlon event on Mont Blanc each year in September. Mm-hmm. Um, their goal is to be um, one, uh, zero, like 100% carbon neutral, um, and we've worked with them for a couple of years, and they work very closely in regards to not only their input but also how their impact on the mountain. It's certainly something that's so um, special. Um, and every year they've been revising and revising, and um, I think they're real market leaders in this sort of stuff. Hmm. Yeah, certainly good food for thought if you're in that space, and plenty of food for thought today. I mean, your story is inspiring, has been an inspiration, and (laughs) I think there's a lot of people probably thinking about doing the things that you've done, and just by hearing your story, I mean, that's the best advice, just to hear your story and learn that it's possible, right? Because... You know, you've faced a lot of challenges and you've stepped outside of your comfort zone and you've made it happen. And it hasn't been a straight line, but that's kind of all part of the process, right? That's the whole package that's made you, whether it's been on the motorbike or moving countries or Great Wall Marathons, Ironman, starting a business, whatever. That's Graham Ross, everybody. Entrepreneur, endurance athlete, founder, co-founder of Kusaga Athletic. Graham, where do we find out more about you, in particular Kusaga as well? Point us in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're on social media. So just look up Kasaga Athletic, K-U-S-A-G-A-A-T-H-L-E-T-I-C. Um, the website is kasagaathletic.com. Uh, um, you can find me around. My name is Graham Ross, G-R-A-H-A-M-R-O-S-S. You can find me around. And anybody wants to talk, I'm an open book. Send me an email with me on, on social media. You can always find my phone number. I'd love to connect and talk to anybody. Fantastic. Graham Ross, everybody. We'll put all the details in the show notes. Graham, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I really want to get you on a future show as well. So let's talk about that now. But six months, a year down the line would be fantastic because you are all about the journey. So six months or 12 months, whether you're up or down, we want to know where you're at. So we'd love to have you back on the show in future and tell us where you are with Kusaga and your latest adventures. I think we'd all be keen to find out what's going on in the world of graham ross that's graham ross everybody graham thank you for joining us on the show today thanks graham really appreciate it it's been a it's been a great chat it's almost a little bit cathartic (laughs) 